Unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Today we want to have a, a call to worship in a responsive way. If we can respond with a line that is written in white, we gather in preparation. We gather in expectation. We gather in celebration. We have said yes to the manger. Yes to love and flesh. Yes to the one incarnate for others. Yes to the wholeness of God. With preparation and expectation, let us celebrate. Let us worship God. Father, we love you. We honor We give you glory. You are our God. We come before you, God, who came to us at the light of the world, in the most darkest place, in our desperate places. God, you shined your light. You spoke life to us. You came as light of the world. You came as life. We give you glory. We worship you today. We honor you, God. May you be glorified in our praise, in our worship. We want to see your face, hear your voice. We love you, God, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
I, I must be getting old. <laughs> Let's confess our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Not on my own understanding My life is in the hands of the maker Heaven I lean not on my own understanding My life is in the hands of the maker of heaven I give it all to you God Trusting that you'll make something beautiful out of me I give it all to you God Trusting that you'll make something beautiful out of me Yeah. 
there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your hold and lead me in your love to those around me holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. I will Upon your love, it is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not Let's just stay in this place. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. Reading from Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, ESV version. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith. And for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him 
who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are such, such a good father. It blows my mind every time when I am reminded of your sacrifice for us. How you gave your one and only son to come down to earth and suffer unwarranted shame, disgrace, pain, and ultimately death. Your love for us far surpasses any that any one of us could ever muster. But knowing full well what you have done for us, we cannot give any excuse but to try. Though the world may throw sticks and stones at us, though our hearts and our bodies may break, give us the ability to keep our eyes focused on you. May we be reminded when things get hard of the path you walked before us. May we be strengthened by your love for us. Help us to run the race set before us with endurance. Help us to persevere knowing that you have already won the battle knowing you are waiting for us with outstretched arms, waiting and desiring to tell us, well done, my good and faithful servant. As we move forward into hearing your word, may our hearts be thirsty. Refresh us today with your cool and living water speak through pastor mimi as you give us the word that we need to hear today in jesus name i pray amen if you can just turn around and greet one another and greet one another in the peace and grace of our lord jesus god is good god is good I want to welcome all of you. I welcome you all in, in Christ Jesus, those who are worshiping in us in person, as well as those who are maybe joining us in online as well. I want to welcome all of you. We are in the midst of an Advent season, which is four Sundays leading up, to, uh, leading up to Christmas. And each of those four Sundays have themes in it. And the uh, first Sunday, last week was the first Sunday of Advent, the theme was hope. And today is the sec- beginning of the second week, second Sunday of Advent, the theme for this week is peace. He is the Prince of Peace. And we are in this season of joy and hope, and, and I'm reminded to stay, especially that in the darkest times, He shone His light. The reason we celebrate his birth on the Christmas day is Christmas day, December 25th, is supposedly the shortest day of the year. And then it begins to, the light begins to get longer. I'm really saying the light has come and he came as a lot of the world. Just want to mention today, right after the service, immediately following the service, there will be a congressional meeting. We ask everyone to stay. Even if you're not a member of our church, you are more than welcome to come and stay with us in this. uh, This is part of our worship as well. And our agenda for today's congregation meeting is twofold. One is uh, electing uh, deacons and elders who will join uh, to serve active leadership next year, as well as approval of 2024 budget. And uh, this week, on Wednesday, we have a special hop our prayer with our mission partner, Sue and Christina, who is a mission partner for the, this month. They'll be joining us this uh, Wednesday at 7.30, 
and you can join and you'll be on Zoom as well as Facebook Live. We will hear some of the updates and we will pray with them and for them in the ministry. Join us for that. And we're going to have time of worship through the giving at this time. As always, you can always give in person as well as online through using the Church Center app. You can always send you know, your offering by, uh, via slow mail, you know, the mail as well. Let us worship God through giving. seconds if you have not given your offering you may give just one announcement that we don't have a slide for next Sunday we have a special guest speaker missionaries Andrew and Noreen Brunson will be with us next Sunday and sharing uh, God's word with us especially also what God is doing with them and through them in this in this season as well okay let us all stand Let us pray. Father, we love you. We worship you through our praises as a people gathered together. Father, we come and we worship you through giving. Through our giving, we declare that indeed you are good and an awesome God who is provider of all good and perfect gifts. We, through our giving, we proclaim, Father God, we are called to be faithful stewards of all that you have and trust it to us through our give through our giving we worship you saying that we belong to you that you are our god that we love you god may you be honored and glorified may your kingdom come may your glory go forth may all the resources be used for your glory and honor to the ends of the earth we love you god we honor you god in midst of our thanksgiving remember to pray for those within our community who are hurting who are in need of your special touch we do not forget, we pray for Rana. Father, we ask your grace upon her even now, God. We pray for those who are physically ill and those who are hurting in our midst. Your grace be upon them. Your healing be upon them. We do love you, God. We give you glory. We worship you, God. We thank you for your bountiful grace, the light that you are to us. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hope kids, you are released. Jam, you are released to go ahead and have your time together in the Word of God. Hello everyone, good afternoon, good afternoon. <clears throat> oh, hi Ian. <laughs> um, as Pastor Q has been mentioning, um, it is the season of Advent, and I don't know if you noticed, but last week he actually said Happy New Year to everyone because it is true. I bet y'all didn't even know that there was such a thing as a Christian calendar. But according to this Christian calendar, the new year has already begun. So happy new year. The church has a calendar where there are seasons, liturgical seasons, and they follow different colors. 
uh, that match. If you go to those um, kind of like um, liturgical high worship churches, you know, they've got vestments and, you know, even our stoles, our, our preaching stoles, as well as different things that they have on the communion table and up here on the um, podium, they have, they change the colors of those vestments. And that's what that is about. So the first Sunday closest to November 30th, I didn't even know this, I looked it up. The first Sunday closest to November 30th, November 30th is St. Andrew's Day, St. Andrew's uh, Day. And that is the first day of the new year, the first Sunday closest to November 30th, according to the Christian um, calendar. So we are in the season of Advent, consists of four weeks. We are in the second week. The word Advent, as we've continued to tell you, it means anticipation. It means coming. It means the coming of. So it is a mood of expectation. It's a mood of hope. You're waiting for something, right? You guys can all kind of identify with that. When you're waiting for something, something good, not bad news. But when you're waiting for something good, there's a anticipation, there's excitement, and there's hope about that good thing to come. When we hear the question, are you ready for Christmas? Let me ask you guys, are you ready for Christmas? No, right? It always sneaks up on us so quickly, right? This year, quicker and faster than other years. But, you know, we say that every year. But when you hear the question, are you ready for Christmas? I think very few people take the question to mean um, the spiritual aspect of it or the spiritual aspect of the season, things related to Jesus Christ, whose birth we're supposed to be celebrating, right? I do think the world has really forgotten that Jesus is the reason for the season, right? And so when you hear the question, are you ready for Christmas? You're thinking about, and the people who said no, probably you mean the Christmas presents haven't been bought yet, you haven't made your Christmas cards yet, that's me. Um, you know, just you, you haven't done this, you haven't done that. You know, a lot of things related to the hustle and bustle of this season. Christmas parties, uh, end of the year events, preparing for this, gifts and family gatherings. That's what you think of when I say, are you ready for Christmas? Even Christians are guilty of it, that we are not focusing on when I say, are you ready for Christmas? Meaning, are you preparing mentally, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually? Are you in that place of really getting excited for the birth of Jesus Christ, celebrating his birth, as well as anticipating, looking ahead, and preparing for his coming again? Who honestly thinks that when we say, are you ready for Christmas? Not many of us. But it is during this Advent season, actually, there is no better voice who talks about anticipation and expectation and all this than John the Baptist, also known as John the Baptizer, but I'm just gonna call him John the Baptist, his traditional name. Um, and he's traditionally associated with this season, with Advent, for the very fact that he's a prophet of both anticipation as well as preparation the themes of Advent. So his message was the one that the prophet Isaiah spoke about way back in the Old Testament, years and years and years before even the birth of Christ, right? Before the New Testament came to be. The prophet Isaiah said, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. And that's who Isaiah, the prophet, was talking about. He was talking about John the Baptist, another prophet that was going to come. And the message was, John the Baptist's message was, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so that is today's title and text. Oh, it's up there. Prepare the way for the Lord. And we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, using the NIV. Now, all four Gospels include the story of John. Many, many times um, there are things between the four Gospels where some Gospel writers include some stories or parables or things, and some don't. But all four, including John, which is not part of the synoptic, they all include stories of John, the one who comes before Jesus. He's the one that comes, he bursts upon the scene, and he's telling everyone to get ready for the coming one, to get ready for the coming Messiah, the one to come who's going to come after me, right? He just bursts on the scene saying this, preaching this message. Most of what we know about John the Baptist's background, though, comes from the Gospel of Luke. The series that Pastor Q is going through, um, you know, by verse by verse, 
only in the Gospel of Luke, well, not only, but that's the most background information that we get about John the Baptist. Now, most of us know this. His parents were Zechariah and Elizabeth, right? Did you know, though, that both of them were descendants of the priestly line of Aaron? They're both, not just Zechariah, the father, but also Elizabeth, too. They're both from the descendant, the, uh, the um, priestly line of Aaron. They lived in the hill country of Judea. Um, his mother, Elizabeth, was cousin of Mary. You know, some people say not the word cousin, but related to. So that makes Mary's son, Jesus, and also Elizabeth's son, John, makes them family make some cousins or second cousins or, or whatnot, but they're family. John's birth was unusual in the fact that his parents are quite old and they were unable to conceive. You can imagine because of their advanced age and also they had uh, fertility problems. So we're gonna look at Luke for the details of how it all came to be, this miraculous birth of John the Baptist. Now, Zechariah was doing his priestly duties as a priest. He was going to the temple, he was burning incense and things like that. So let's look at Luke chapter one verses 11 through 17. Here it is. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a, a people prepared for the Lord. Now this angel Gabriel, he appears to Mary to tell her also about her impending pregnancy, but he also lets her know that, hey, your cousin Elizabeth is pregnant too, right? And that's big news for Mary. And so Mary decides to go visit Elizabeth. So let's look at that encounter, and that's 39, Luke 1, 39 through 41. At that time, Mary got ready, and after she heard about that her cousin was pregnant in her old age, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted her, her relative, her cousin Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. When the angel first told Zechariah about having um, a son, he doubted, and he didn't believe. So the angel caused the father, Zechariah, to become mute, so that he was removed the ability to speak, the ability to have speech. He became mute until after the birth. So eight days after the birth of John, after Elizabeth gives birth to their son John, eight days afterwards, Zechariah could then speak again. And what were his first words? When he was able to speak again, after eight days, his son is born, his first words were praise and prophecy. If you look here, Chapter 1, verses 67, uh, verse 67 and 68. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. Now, I highlighted in yellow, as you can see, this was a Holy Spirit-filled family. Did you ever notice that? Here it says, Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. Back up, and it said that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and even John, the baby in utero, was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's very specific. Think about it. That the Bible goes out of its way to mention that this family, Zechariah, Elizabeth, and even the baby before the baby is born, in utero, all three filled with the Holy Spirit. Very spirit-filled family here. And this long chapter, this first chapter of Luke is quite long, but it ends with the telling that John says, it says that John 
grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. So he grew in spirit, he grew in strength, and he was living in the wilderness until he, became, until he began his public ministry. In John, uh, John actually begins and appears publicly as we hear about in the chapter third of Matthew. So Matthew chapter three is when we hear about John the Baptist. So that's, what, that's our text for today, and that's what we're gonna look at. John, uh, Matthew chapter three, verses one through 10. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. Remember in the Old Testament? A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think that you can say to yourselves, well, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now I found this visual online you know, a lot of times um, John the Baptist is depicted as this wild haired eating, you know, locusts and, and things like that. So uh, here's a, a visual that I found. Sometimes it's good to kind of get a visual. So as people run around, as all of us say, we're not ready for Christmas yet, we're running around getting ready for Christmas, I want to look at four things that this Holy Spirit-filled man, father Spirit-filled, mother Spirit-filled, he was even before he was born, this Holy Spirit-filled man of God, what he told the people of Israel at that time to do, to get ready for the coming of Jesus, who is the Messiah, the Christ. And these four things are very uh, um, appropriate and instructional for us today because the message of John the Baptist then is the same message that we need to hear today during this season. So the first thing is prepare obviously, right? The first thing that we need to do to get ready for the coming um, of Christ is prepare. Although John the Baptist is known for baptizing, I mean, it's, that's even in the title of his name, John the Baptist, even though that's what he's known for, he is first and foremost a prophet. I think we forget that. He is a voice of God speaking forth, first and foremost, a prophet. And as a prophet, he comes with the word from God. He comes with the word from God for God's people. And that word is prepare, to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. And we know from Matthew's gospel, as I read, that he is the one that the prophet Isaiah spoke of so, so, so many years ago, the voice calling in the wilderness. But I want to look at Isaiah, the original text in Isaiah talking about that. So chapter 40, verses 3 through 5 in Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So this is a prophet speaking forth, saying this is the word of the Lord. And then this, who he's talking about, is in the New Testament, this John that bursts upon the scene. The word prepare in Hebrew, it refers to a clearing out. 
So I don't know what you're thinking when I say prepare your hearts and let's prepare for the coming of the Lord. But in Hebrew, the root of it is, it, the, the meaning and the root of it is to clear out. So we're to clear away and clear out a way for the Lord, to make a smooth highway for our God. So this refers to the ancient Near Eastern, we call it for short A-N-E, the ancient Near Eastern custom of sending representatives before and ahead to prepare the way for a king that is coming to visit. Now, back then, of course, they didn't have these nice asphalt, uh, nice roads and, you know, overpass and underpass and interchanges and things like that. So when a king traveled, representatives would be sent ahead of the king's visit, and the road that the king would be traveling on would be repaired. So they would maybe fill in some potholes, they would remove some fallen trees, um, they, would, uh, you know, they would make the bumpy roads, make the roads smooth or, you know, passable, make the bumpy roads, uh, you know, more pleasant to go on, you know, stuff like that. So that's what they're thinking in the ancient Near Eastern when he says prepare the word to clear it out and make that path smooth and pleasant for the coming king to travel on. So just as a road had to be cleared, of these obstacles, fallen trees or big boulders or anything like that, debris, before the king can actually come through, John was calling for the people to remove the things in their lives that would hinder, that was going to become an obstacle um, to them accepting and welcoming the coming king. So that imagery is so powerful. You know, you think about what are the things, fallen trees, potholes, um, shrubbery, debris in the road, uh, things like that. What is it that's in our hearts and in our minds that are posing, you know, obstacles and hindrances to us preparing this smooth way for the Lord to come, the king of glory to come straight into my heart, to come straight into my life, and, and to just be with me. That's a really powerful image there. So remember this as you go about preparing your house for Christmas. Chances are, when you guys do your holiday, annual holiday decorations, I don't know how many of us do that, but for those of you who prepare your house uh, for the holidays, I bet that you had to clear some things. Maybe you had to move some furniture to fit the Christmas tree. Maybe you had to clean some corners of the living room or uh, the area in front of the window so that you can put the Christmas tree there so that people can see it. You know, things that you had to do to prepare your house for the Christmas decorations. We do. My daughter Maddie is all about Christmas. She absolutely loves um, the Christmas tree. And every year, I actually don't enjoy uh, the Christmas tree because the little pine needles get everywhere. It's a plastic tree, okay? It's not even real, but those things get everywhere, and we have to move the sofa, sometimes the piano, and I just don't like it, right? Um, but my daughter, Maddie, absolutely loves it. She even puts it on our family calendar the day after Thanksgiving. She has it on our family calendar, put up the tree, right? And so I was like, this is the last year we're putting up the tree because you guys are going away to college. And so I don't have to do this anymore, right? And so then after I said that, I actually realized I have to do it more because if they go away to college, they're going to come home for Christmas and spend Christmas at home. And if this is what she loves, then I, there's more, I need to do it more for her because I don't get to see her throughout the other days. So you're safe, Maddie. This Christmas tree will be up every Christmas when you come home. But yes, you have to move things, move furniture, and to make room. So as you prepare to celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, and as we look ahead and anticipate his coming again in this season, make room. It's like that praise song. Make room in your hearts and your minds for Jesus. Second, after prepare, is what do we do to get ready for this coming king? We confess. Second thing we can do is confess. Let's look at our text again, Matthew 3, 5 through 6. It says, people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Confession is often very overlooked. We're very much familiar with the ACTS model of prayer, right? Most people are familiar, ACTS, A-C-T-S. And I think most of us are pretty good with the A. 
We love to adore God. We love to praise him and the adoration of God. We're pretty good at that. T is for Thanksgiving. And again, I think we're pretty good about remembering to give thanks. We're so thankful for a lot of things, especially in our house churches. What do we always do? Part of the sharing is, what are you thankful for? Because we really want our, the youngest, even our babies, to always have that mindset of being thankful. So being thankful and thanking God, we don't often forget that. Supplication means asking God for things. I know we're really good at that, right? We're really good at asking God for things in prayer. There's no need for me to remind y'all, oh, you know, you can ask him for things because we do it naturally so much. But look at the second one, confession. Many of us skip over confession. And I've actually heard some people argue this. They say, God is all knowing. He knows everything I do anyway. Why do I got to tell him about it? He knows, he sees right? So why do I have to confess it? But to confess means to acknowledge and to admit that you've done something wrong. To acknowledge and to admit that you've done something wrong. It's not, it's not enough for us to just say in general, I'm a sinner. There, that was my confession. You know, I'm a sinner. It's not enough to just say, I've sinned today. I'll do better tomorrow you know, and just kind of generalize it and say, yes, he knows we're sinners. Yes, he knows we sinned today, right? Our confessions need to be direct and it needs to be specific. A lot of our prayers, you know, we say, why do we pray? Why do we pray? It is for the dialogue. It's for the relationship. Of course, God already knows even our requests before we ask, right? And God knows how great he is. <laughs> Not to say he's conceited, but he knows how awesome he is, right? So us adoring him, us thanking him, us, um, you know, asking him for things. He knows all those things too, but it's really for us when we are speaking with him, spending time with him, right? And so our confessions as well need to be direct and specific. It's a time that we are in dialogue with him. If you look at the Old Testament, especially in Leviticus, starting in Leviticus chapter 4, how many of us read Leviticus, right? Only once when we read the Bible through in a year. But Leviticus chapter 4, if you remember, you see a lot of information about sin offerings. And we kind of tend to skip over that part. It's very complex and very detailed. But there's a lot of information, very interesting information about sin offerings. There are specific animals that are required that you need to sacrifice for specific sins. Did you, did you know that? There are specific animals that are to be sacrificed for specific types of sins. Your offering is different according to the sin that you committed. And these offerings are not, they're not done in secret, but it's like public offerings, public sacrifices, right? And so it's like out in the open. So all the people can see what you're offering. So if people know you need to offer this particular animal for this particular sin, and everyone sees you offering that particular animal, we all know what, what sin you committed, basically, right? If you think about it that way, because it's out in the open. People know what sins that you are uh, confessing and sacrificing and asking for forgiveness for. Now, when I think about that in the Old Testament Leviticus, I don't think that that same practice would go over well with us today. How many of us want everyone else to know what sins I've committed, what particular sins I'm asking for forgiveness for, and that I am uh, doing sacrifices for, right? And we feel that it's just too personal. You know, that's just between me and God. Nobody else needs to know. It, it really is just between me and God. In some ways, yes. But we cannot forget what else is in the Bible. James chapter 5 verse 16. My favorite book in the Bible is James. Very practical. James 5, 16 says, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Confessing our sins to one another can bring healing. 
It can bring healing. So I'm not saying that we should broadcast all our sins to everybody here at the church. We should have public confessions where each of us line up and come up and start confessing. I'm not saying that you need to post it on social media and blast it for everyone to see. But we should consider finding other brothers and sisters in Christ that we can confess to, that we can confide in, so that they can pray with us. That is the biblical uh, model that we confide you know, in and we confess to so that, not to just get it off our chest and feel you know, refreshed, so that they can pray with us. And with that prayer, healing can come. Only then can true healing come. Accountability is such a powerful thing. It's such a powerful thing. Oftentimes when we keep things inside and to ourselves, whether it's promises that we make to God, resolutions, New Year's is coming up, so any New Year's resolutions, anything that you say in that way, if it's only to yourself, then if you end up not doing it, or you end up doing it, you said you would never do it again, who's gonna know, right? But if you share those things with someone, you can confide in and confess that these are my New Year's resolutions, these are the things I'm hoping and going to try not to do in the new year, or these are things I'm going to do in the new year, then it's out there and they can hold you accountable. I think that is such a powerful thing. Same thing about dreams. A lot of times we have dreams. We have like hopes and aspirations about whether it's your career, whether it's your future retirement plans. You have different hopes and dreams and thoughts. I absolutely encourage you to share them. Don't keep it all inside, but share your plans, your hopes, and your dreams, just so that another person walking on the earth knows it, besides God, God knows it all, but someone else knows it, and they can say, hey, whatever happened to when you said you dreamed of being this or dreamed of doing that, you know? And that is always a very, very good reminder when it comes back. Um, this is a Scottish proverb that I'm sure where a lot of people are familiar with. Open confession is good for the soul. It is indeed. Sometimes to get things off your chest, it's good for the soul. Scottish proverb. The third thing after prepare, confess, is to repent. Some people think confess and repent are the same thing. They are not. The third thing we should do to get ready for Jesus is coming again, we need to repent. Remember verses 1 and 2. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repentance is taking confession to the next level. It's taking it up a notch to another level. And this was a major theme of John's message. John the Baptist said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of God is here, right? Um, to repent literally means to change your mind. It means to change uh, your heart, to change your mind and to have a change of heart. The Old Testament Hebrew that this word comes from is to turn away from or return to. Think about that, to turn away from or return to. So it's not just turning away from sin or things that are not of God, but it's also a returning to God, meaning you were with God to begin with. You turned away, you need to repent and come back. You need to turn back, return to God. And this is always the case with repentance because it is impossible to turn back to God by our own strength. No one can do it. No one can. It's we need to turn to God by the strength and power of the Holy Spirit. And when we turn away from sin, we have to turn to something. Otherwise, we're going to turn away from this sin and go to a, a different sin. We're just going to replace that. But we need to return to God. And why was John calling the people to repentance here? As I said, he was saying that the kingdom of God is near. The people of Israel, the Jewish people, they have always been waiting for a Messiah. They still wait today. They are waiting even today for the Savior, for the Messiah to come. And here is John, a cousin of Jesus, saying the kingdom of God 
is at hand. And we know later when Jesus unrolls the scroll, he reads from the prophet Isaiah and he says, the kingdom is now here. And he's basically saying, voila, I'm here, right? It is in me. I am the kingdom and the kingdom is here. And his message, John the Baptist, he is saying, the one who is greater than me, the one whose sandal straps I am not even worthy of untying, I cannot even touch his feet, that is the one that is coming. And just as he came then, he is coming again. Are we ready? Were the people then ready? Are we ready? Are you ready for Christmas? That same message of repentance is for us today, especially during this season. Fourth and final, prepare. John the Baptist's message is we have to confess as we prepare for the Lord. We have to repent. We also have to produce fruit. A lot of people forget this fourth one. We have to produce fruit. Many from the whole region of Judea and the Jordan River area were coming out to see him, and they wanted to be baptized by him. It wasn't just, you know, the common folk, but he said even the leaders, the Jewish leaders, Pharisees and Sadducees, were coming to him to get baptized, right? Remember um, John's words in verses 8 and 9. Let me remind you. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not think that you can say to yourselves, oh, we have Abraham as our father, because I tell you this, that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham, right? These were Jewish leaders. It seems that they were coming out to be baptized by, um, by John the Baptist as well. But John saw that, he saw through them. He saw through them, and he called them a brood of vipers, right? He called them snakes. And the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Jewish, Jewish leaders, their thinking was that if they get baptized, their thinking is that, they, that it would protect them, that it would ensure them against the coming wrath. So they believed the message that there was wrath coming, there was judgment coming. So they wanted to dot all their I's, cross all their T's, and be ready. And so they figure, oh, let me, let me get a little some of that. Let me get baptized, right, by John, and that would maybe protect them and ensure them against the coming wrath. Just as, and, and John sees right through them, because he says, just as their claim to Abraham as their ancestor entitles them automatically to all of God's blessings and promises um, to Abraham, they automatically claim that as direct descendants, right? But John challenges them here. He says, if there was genuine repentance, then there would be fruit. If there is change, if there is repentance, there's got to be fruit. There's got to be something that shows. There's got to be fruit demonstrated about that repentance. In Luke's version of this event, when John tells them this, as I said, each gospel tells of this story. In Luke's version, John says, repent, you know, and who told you to come, you brood of vipers, and he says all this. The people actually ask, what should we do then? What are these um, fruits that we can produce? What should we do? It doesn't say so here in Matthew, but in Luke, it, John actually, it records John mentioning specific examples of the kind of fruit that he's talking about. Uh, I don't have it on a slide, but on Luke chapter 3, verses 11 through 14, some of the things that John the Baptist specifically mentions is, share your clothes and share your food with those who have none. He says, don't collect more taxes than you need to from the people. Don't overtax them and get greedy. He says, don't take money by force or accuse people falsely, right? Don't persecute and go after people. And he says, be content with your pay. This is living a life that produces fruit. These are specific examples in, in the Gospel of Luke that John mentions. Otherwise, this is the scary part, verse 10. Otherwise, the ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. John the Baptist remained committed to his message. 
I love John the Baptist. Of, of all the many biblical figures, I love him because in a day and age where so many of us don't know our identity and our role and our purpose in life, most of us are always asking, what's my purpose? Why am I here? What is life about? Who am I? You're trying to find your meaning, your purpose, and discover who you are. There's no better person than John the Baptist. He knew exactly who he was, exactly, that he was the one called to, you know, preach, make way, the kingdom of God is at hand. But what I love even more than the fact that he knew exactly who he was is the fact that he knew exactly who he wasn't. That's the fact that I love the most. He knew exactly who he wasn't because people said, are you the Christ? Are you this? Are you that? He was so clear. He's like, I am not he. He is coming. The ones who sandal, I cannot even you know, untie. He is coming. He was very, very clear about pointing at the one greater who is coming. People wanted to make him this. People, he had disciples too. And they were like, oh, some people are following this dude named Jesus, but aren't you the, the main guy? And you know, he, Jesus had disciples. John had disciples. He was so clear. In a day and age where we're so into who I am, John the Baptist was all about who I am not. And when we know who we're not, that speaks volumes of who we are. Does that make sense? He was so clear on who he is not. The greater one is coming. I find that so, so powerful. And so he never deviated from this message. He never got big in his head or got tempted to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm his cousin. We, I, I got the same power. We family. And, you know, trying to ride off of that, of the glory of this Messiah coming. He consistently preached about the coming of the Lord. Don't look at me. I'm just the messenger. And he was consistently pointing to the coming of the Lord. He warned the people to prepare their hearts, look to his coming. So as we get ready for Christmas, and the praise team can come on up, as we prepare for Christmas with all the things that we have to do, all the things that we have to get done, right? Still buying gifts, still trying to mail out our Christmas cards, still trying to get our Christmas party plans together. Remember this voice calling in the wilderness. It's reminding us of how to truly prepare, how to truly in this time that we need to be confessing, repenting, and producing fruit. And that, my friends, is how we genuinely prepare for Christmas. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today. And in the midst of all this chaotic busyness and preparing for the season, Father, help us to take a step back and be reminded. We hear so clearly this voice this, this one voice calling from the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Father, help us to take seriously that message and see what is within the clutter of our hearts, the clutter of our minds, even the clutter of our physical space. We look around our homes, we look around our workplaces, and Father, help us to see clearly what are the things that we need to move, that we need to clear out, that we need to make smooth so that the path of the Lord coming will be made easy. So Father, we commit this to you, God. We say we are yours. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. We wait during this Advent season. In Jesus' name, amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. 
Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Only there is no one like you, there is none besides you. Open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your hold and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none besides you. Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around me And I will build my life Upon your love It is a from foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken and I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone And I will not be shaken Holy, there is none beside you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. During this Advent season, may we all prepare the way for the Lord and make our path straight for his coming again. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the incredible love of God the Father who sent his one and only Son at Christmas, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Uh, as you know, today we have our congregational meeting, so we will take a brief break, whether it's for the bathroom or just stretch your legs, but we will not have refreshments or fellowship time until after the meeting, just so that we can um, save our time. So if you need a quick bathroom break or stretching of legs, that's fine, but let's try to gather back here in less than five minutes so that we can begin our congregational meeting.